Come one, come all, to the insanity that is Disgaea. I recently made a guide to Disgaea 1 and plan to make my way through the whole series, eventually. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend checking it out since all these games build on each other. I'm going to make this assuming you have the knowledge of the mechanics and rules already established in Disgaea 1. So without further ado, let's move on to Disgaea 2 PC. As usual, I'll start by going over the basic mechanics and tools you'll be using throughout the game. A lot of it just carries over from the first game, so I'll go over the differences between the two as well as the new mechanics introduced. The shop and item ranks work exactly the same, but this time, instead of being able to get up to rank 38 items in the shop, you can only get up to rank 34 items. I'll go more in depth on how to get higher ranking items when we get into post game. The item world has had a few adjustments. The same rarity system for items is still in place, ranging from 0 to 255, and the number of item world floors remains the same as they did in the first game between the three different rarities. 30 floors for common, 60 for rare, and 100 for legendary. What has changed about this, however, is the max level cap for each item. Instead of level 100, you can now get items up to level 200. Each floor still only gives one level to the item, but you can earn bonus levels in varying ways. I'll cover exactly how to get an item up to level 200 later. The other big change to the item world is the addition of mystery rooms. Mystery rooms can randomly appear in any floor in the form of their own special portal you can enter instead of the normal one you use to progress to the next floor. These green mystery room portals will take you into one of many possible rooms, each with their own unique purpose and effect. These aren't too important in normal play, but become extremely important when max leveling items. For now, you can just explore these rooms at your leisure. When you leave them, they'll drop you off at the same floor you entered them from, and there won't be any chance for them to spawn again until at least three floors later. Also new to the item world is pirates. There are a lot of different pirate groups that have a random chance of invading the floor you're on after the end of a turn. If you're specifically looking for pirates, you really only need to wait a couple of turns each floor, since if they haven't spawned by then, they're most likely not going to on that floor. They don't spawn on every floor. As you go higher in the item world, there'll be more pirate groups that can spawn, raising your chances of invasion. The leader of each pirate group will be holding a map, and you're going to want to get these maps by either defeating the leaders or stealing the maps from them. These maps will be the key to unlocking big post-game content. I also recommend keeping track of which pirates you've already obtained maps from, for reasons that'll be clear later. The Dark Assembly works pretty much the same way, and even has some quality of life upgrades. There's no more influence anymore, and instead your chances of passing a bill is displayed on the screen. Although I don't think this is quite what that is, as even a 20% or lower chance can make passing a bill normally seem impossible. I think it's more like the chances of each senator voting for you, or something to that effect. Regardless, the chances of passing the bill will be greater the higher this percentage is. Additionally, no more assembly ranks to unlock new bills. Promotion exams are a thing of the past. You can just pass whatever bills you can whenever you want, as long as you still have enough mana, plus whatever other prerequisite conditions there are. No more influence either. Regarding the stronger enemy bills, you no longer have to pass each one separately, and instead can just shoot up to the strongest enemies with one bill, equal to passing all 20 stronger enemy bills, or even pass an intermediary bill that's equivalent to passing 10 stronger enemy bills. There is one important change though, as Adele, you have the option to attend a meeting as a senator. All this does is display a variety of bills that other party members or NPCs want to pass, and Adele can sit in and help. We'll be using this a few times for specific bills we need for achievements. 
When it comes to battle mechanics, they're essentially the same. However, monsters are given a little more utility with the magic change feature. This was actually first introduced in Disgaea 3, but was then added to future Disgaea 2 re-releases. Magic change allows a monster unit to become a weapon for a humanoid unit to use. Honestly, I never found much use for this feature, and oddly enough, it doesn't even become unlocked until entering the extra character mode you can do after the main story, similar to how Etna mode was in Disgaea 1. When taking on a monster weapon, the humanoid class will inherit some of their stats. It's not entirely clear how this works, and you generally have to level up a monster pretty high to benefit from this stats-wise, but when you magic change, the humanoid can also inherit the monster's ability on top of their own during magic change. More on abilities later. Residents, now called Innocents in this game and all games going forward, are relatively untouched. There's a new graphic next to each one, making it a bit more clear when an Innocent is subdued or unsubdued, as opposed to the saturated versus unsaturated dot in Disgaea 1. Almost all of the important Innocents are still here in this game, and there are even some new helpful ones. The Mentor increases skill experience gain by 1% per Innocent level, capping at 300. The Professional increases critical hit chance by 1% per level, capping at, of course, 100%. You can probably guess how important this one is, it's basically a must-have. The Arms Master is still here, still with a tie cap of 1900, as well as all the single stat specialists. Again, they have a cap of 19,999 per Innocent, and again, I said screw that. There are also Innocents, which increase elemental resistances. Arrow Knot for Wind, Firefighter for Fire, and Cryophile for Water. These were also present in Disgaea 1, but weren't very important. However, in this game, they'll definitely be more beneficial, as magic is the big damage dealer in this entry, and the higher your elemental resistance is, the more damage you do with that element, so make sure you invest in at least one of these. Now, I did say almost all of the important innocents are here. There's one that isn't here, and it's a very important one, the Statistician. I think Satan himself made this game to be honest, and one of his many tricks was removing the Statistician Innocent and implementing an entirely new system to gaining bonus experience, the Felony System. I'll talk more in depth about this later, but it's your only way of getting to that 300% bonus experience from killing enemies that Statisticians gave you in Disgaea 1. There's also the Lover's Innocent, which has a different effect depending on which class or character it's associated with. More on that later. Transmigration, now called Reincarnation for the rest of the series, is still in place and works the same way. Creating characters is the same too, and there's a new mix of classes to choose from. An important thing to note is that mages no longer have Braveheart. Both mages and magicians focus on debuffing enemies, while clerics have the ally buff skills including Braveheart in addition to their healing. One of these buffs is also Magic Boost, which works the same way as Braveheart but with intelligence instead of attack. These are applied the same way as in Disgaea 1, so you'll need the spell to be cast 5 times on a character to receive that 100% stat buff. Another major change this game has is passive skills. I'm gonna go ahead and call them Evilities for simplicity's sake because that's what they're called in Disgaea 3 onwards and they're basically the same thing. They just can't be transferred between classes or characters. Each unique character, as well as each class, has their own ability that just gives them an extra passive ability. Adele's ability makes him deal 50% more damage to enemies of a higher level than him, mages reduce all their SP used by 50%, etc, etc. Before we get into the grind, I'll mention the one class you're gonna want to level up for maximum damage in this game. Much like the Majin in Disgaea 1, there's an optimal class used in Disgaea 2 that you'll want to stick with for endgame, and that is the Magic Knight. This is meant to be a class specializing in both physical and magic skills, but all you need are the magic ones. That's because magic is absurdly broken in this game for whatever reason, and the Magic Knight's ability boosts her elemental resistance, and therefore damage, by a clean 25%. So now, instead of getting the rank 40 sword, the Yoshitsuna in the endgame, you're going to want to go for the rank 40 staff instead, the Omnipotent Rod. Although you're still going to want to get the Yoshitsuna anyway at some point since there's an achievement specifically just for getting it. Life's a bitch, huh? On top of the Magic Knight's inherent ability, there's also a way to add an extra 50% damage to her magic attacks, and that's through the Lover Innocent. In short, the Lover Innocent increases all stats of whatever character it's on by 1% per level, capping at 25. It also has the added bonus of buffing that character's ability for every level the Innocent is. Since the Magic Knight's ability makes her do more damage with magic attacks, the Lover's Innocent amplifies this with 1% more damage added on top of that for each level. This means with Lovers, the Magic Knight gets 50% more elemental damage and a 25% stat increase, totaling 75% more damage with elements. This is a big boost to just passively have. As for how to obtain Lover's Innocence, that's a bit tricky. Normally you can just find Innocence on random items in the shop or something, but not here. The Lover's Innocent is unique in that the only way to obtain it is by making it spawn on already equipped items. You have to have an item of at least rank 5 equipped for a long period of time for a chance to have a Lover spawn on it, and the Lover will be the version of whatever character you're using. So equipment on a Magic Knight will spawn a Magic Knight Lover. 
The character also has to be out of the base panel for this chance to register. If you unequip the item at any point, the counter resets. Additionally, the value of the lover that spawns varies between rarities, with 1 for common, 2 for rare, and 3 for legendary. So the general strategy for this is to equip 4 rank 5 or higher legendary items, and keep grinding the same map over and over until a lover spawns at all the items. Luckily, these come unsubdued, so once you do this once, you'll have 4 level 3 lovers, and then you can subdue them all to make them level 6, and combine them to have a level 24 lover right out the gate. Note that an item that a lover has spawned on before cannot spawn another lover, ever. And with that, let's get into the main story. Where can you start grinding early on? This game doesn't quite have as many story maps good for grinding as Yskaya 1 did, but there are still some good ones. 4-3 is the first really notable one. The stage is covered in geo panels that make enemies level up by 10% every single turn. This is essentially an early grinder's paradise, as all you have to do is wait for the enemies to be as high of a level as you want them to be. The higher level you go though, the more tedious it gets because you keep having to wait more and more turns, but you can still make a lot of mileage here in a reasonable amount of time. Just make sure you don't let them get too strong for you because then you can't clear the map. I recommend camping out near the geo symbol until everyone's just the right level before destroying it and proceeding to clear the map. The other big grinding spot that basically became my second home in the later part of the story is 9-2. There will be two 2x2 two two formations of enemies with XP tiles on them. This is pretty straightforward, and you can level up a good deal here with stronger enemy builds. 12-1 also provides some experience boost symbols you can use. After clearing the main story and being thrust into the post game is where things get a bit complicated. There's much more to do here than there was in Disgaea 1, and the order of things isn't so cut and dry. I'll be going over some of the things you can do to boost your stats, levels, and overall power, as well as all the post game content and how to unlock it. Before I go into that though, I want to reiterate real quick that pretty much all of the mechanics in Disgaea 1 are still present here unless stated otherwise. This means you can still get Arms Masters and max out your Weapon Mastery for more damage, level up skills for more damage, now made easier through the Mentor Innocent, utilize stat boosting Innocence, and reincarnate just like before. And also just like before, you can still boost your experience gained, just not through statisticians. I'm gonna get this whole thing out of the way right now since it's only a matter of time before you'll be ready for it. This is the lovely, oh so wonderful, Felony System. So you may have noticed this NPC here throughout your journey, and you may have been receiving the subpoenas from them. You can get these subpoenas for fulfilling certain requirements throughout the game, and most are character specific. Not that only one character can make use of them, but that the requirements apply to each separate character. For example, there are subpoenas for reaching certain stat thresholds. Let's take the 20,000 stat subpoenas. There are 6 of these, one for each stat, barring HP and SP, which have their own number requirements. So say you reach 20,000 attack on Adele. Wonderful! Talk to the NPC and you can choose from your list of characters. Under Adele's name, you can collect the subpoena you've earned from doing this. And these apply to every character, meaning you can then get Rosalind to 20,000 attack, and get yet another subpoena, and so on. And since there are separate subpoenas for every stat, it becomes pretty easy at a certain point in postgame to reincarnate characters and immediately hit those thresholds again for loads of these. Because yes, you can get them again after reincarnating. These aren't the only subpoenas though, but more on that in a sec. So what can you actually do with these things? Well, you'll notice that they all come with a very special innocent called the Bailiff, and the nice thing about these is that they are subdued by default and therefore can be moved to other items at will. This will be handy, trust me. The level of the Bailiff represents which floor you need to climb in order to reap the Bailiff's benefits, which comes in the form of a special portal appearing on that floor. So for a Bailiff of level 14, you need to climb to floor 14 and enter the special portal that'll appear there. Entering this portal takes you to a courtroom where you'll be deemed a criminal for performing whatever action you got the subpoena for. But since we're demons, crimes are good, and we'll get a shiny felony stamp when whatever character enters the portal. Each tier of subpoena quote unquote, gives a different amount of felonies, with some exceptions. The different tiers can have bailiffs of level 6 to 14, 16 to 24, and 36 to 44. These generally apply to the character specific stat subpoenas, high attack versus too high attack versus way too high attack. But there are also other useful ones, like mastery subpoenas. Each character can receive subpoenas for reaching level 15 mastery in a certain weapon. Actually, any weapon they want, meaning theoretically every humanoid class can have 7 of these, one for each weapon. It's usually only worth it to get it for the weapon they're best with though, as the lower their affinity with a weapon, the slower they gain mastery experience for it. So just plop a max arms master in whoever you want to level up a weapon with, and it should be pretty quick if they have a high affinity with it. There's also a mastery subpoena for reaching a total of level 15 across any skills they have pertaining to a specific element, with different subpoenas for each element. The thing about these mastery subpoenas though is that their bailiffs will be in a tier of their own, levels 56 to 64. 
There are a lot of miscellaneous subpoenas on top of all these, but they don't do all that much and generally aren't worth specifically going after. If you happen to have them though, feel free to make use of them. As to how many felonies you'll be getting from these, Tier 1 felonies will give you 2, the next tier gives you 6, and the third tier gives you 10, and the mastery tier gives you 12. Any miscellaneous ones will vary. Each felony earned will give you a variety of benefits, but the important one is the increase in experience earned by defeating enemies. Just like statisticians in Disgaea 1, each felony will grant a 1% increase to experience earned, up to a maximum of 300. The stamps each character gets for their felonies visually cap out at 99, but the effects go up to 300. Thankfully, you can still check to see how many they have past 99 in their stats menu. If you think about it for a bit, yeah, that sounds like an awful lot of work. And what's worse, felonies are character specific. So whichever character walks through that portal is the only character who gets the felonies and they can't be transferred or shared. It's a ridiculously tedious system. Don't worry though, there are methods to make the system a little more bearable. I'll be outlining a particular strategy you can use to do this as fast as possible. The first thing to note is that yes, while the only characters who gain felonies are those who enter the portals, that's not to say multiple people can't enter a portal at a time, and you don't even need to have the character the subpoena was actually for to get them. You can actually throw a whole stack of characters into the portal and each one will receive all the felonies. For this reason, make sure you know all the characters you want to give felonies to before grinding them. Because if another character comes along that you decide you want to give felonies to after already going through this process, you gotta do the whole thing again just for them. As for the strategy itself, here's how it goes. We are going to absolutely abuse the fact that these bailiffs can be transferred to other items. Set yourself up by collecting subpoenas of pretty much every value of bailiff possible. That means even numbers in all these ranges. Multiples of 10 don't appear though because these are the boss floors. As long as you have most of the numbers, you'll still get a good amount of felonies, or I wouldn't sweat getting all of them unless you really want to. You'll be doing this multiple times anyway. The first thing you're going to do after the setup is find your highest level bailiff, which should be from one of your mastery subpoenas. The nice thing about these is that they're always legendary, which is important for the extra floors. Take that bailiff out and put it aside in another item, just to get it out of the way. Don't lose it though, because you're going to want to use it later. Now get your lowest level bailiff and put it in the now bailiffless legendary subpoena. Enter the item and go into the court like normal. Now immediately exit the item world, get rid of the bailiff, and replace it with the next lowest bailiff you have in its place. Or if there's a multiple of 10 between them, you can just exit the item world in that floor as to not waste a Genzi. So if you just cleared a floor 8 bailiff, exit the item world in floor 10, replace the level 8 bailiff with a level 12, or 14, or whatever you have next, and hop back in. Now you only have to climb a few more floors to reach the next bailiff gate, receive those felonies, and rinse and repeat all the way up the ladder. Keep cycling through this process until you have reached 300 felonies on each character you wish to. It's a painful process, but remember you can do multiple characters at the same time through stacks, which I recommend always doing, and it makes future grinding much easier with the increased experience gain. And speaking of grinding, the iconic Cave of Ordeals is back. Again, this appears as a bill you can pass in the Dark Assembly, and again, this house is the best grinding spot in the entire game. This time, the prize map is Cave of Ordeals 4. It consists of a 4x2 formation of marionette enemies, and what kinda sucks about this stage is that you can't wipe them out in one hit like you could for the 3x3s in Disgaea 1. It takes two attacks minimum to clear this stage. I remember having trouble actually getting to the point where I could easily survive and wipe out the enemies on this stage, so remember to use buffs like Braveheart and Magic Boost, and maybe even invest in some stat specialists like Hit for accuracy and evasion, or Intelligence or Attack for more damage. Personally, I've never messed with the stat specialist for reasons like this, and kinda tend to brute force my way forward, but it's an option. Remember to use stronger enemy builds if you can handle them for even more experience. Once you are sufficiently leveled, you may want to start checking out the real endgame area, the Land of Carnage. Yes, it's as every bit as terrifying as it sounds, but even more terrifying is the unlock requirement. And for that, we have to talk about pirates again. You know those maps that the pirate captains are holding? I really hope you've been getting those whenever you can, because you need all of them to unlock the Land of Carnage. This means you must encounter and obtain the maps of every single pirate group that can ambush you in the item world. This can take a long time. What I did was start climbing through a legendary item from floor 1, exiting and saving after every threshold after which new pirates can appear. The goal was to encounter all or almost all of the new pirate types possible in those floors. So say, from floor 1 to 20, I'd try my best to encounter these pirates that can appear there. If I didn't get any, or not enough, I'd reload my save and try again. If I did, I'd save again on floor 20 and keep going. This time going for the floor 21 plus pirates in addition to previous pirates I may not have yet encountered. The goal here is to reasonably be able to encounter all of the pirates in one item world climb, saving or reloading after each 10th floor, thus collecting all the maps. The nice thing is that there aren't any new pirates after floor 41 other than the ones that appear there, except for one at floor 61. 
giving you some breathing room in the latter half of the item world. An important thing to note is that you can equip the treasure maps you've already gained onto characters to increase the chances of pirate spawning. The more maps equipped, the higher the chances. I don't think the units with the maps equipped have to be out of the base panel to get this bonus, so they can be on anyone. There are technically two more types of pirates that appear on floor 91 and above, but they're Land of Carnage exclusive, so obviously they don't count in here, as it's not even possible to encounter them yet. Once you finally collect all the maps, a giant boat will appear in the hub world with an NPC in front of it. Talking to the NPC will take you to the Land of Carnage. The Land of Carnage is just the same as the normal game. I'm serious, that's the best way to put it. You can do everything you can do in the normal game here. Story content, item world, dark assembly, etc, etc. The one difference though, as you may have guessed, is that all the enemies are stronger. And I mean like, a lot stronger. You will want to ease yourself into this, and definitely don't go straight to Cave of Ordeals 4 because, uh, good luck with that. Oh, and I suppose there is one more slight difference that's just a little bit important. I can finally talk about higher ranking items, because nowhere outside of the Land of Carnage can you find any items above rank 34. For the higher ranking items, they have to be obtained here. As for actually getting rank 40 items, they're obtained the same way as in Disgaea 1. Find a legendary rank 39 item in the item world and steal the rank 40 from the item god. It just needs to be done in the Land of Carnage. And don't worry, all you need to do in the Land of Carnage is find and steal these items. You don't actually have to do the entire item world in the Land of Carnage. So go through your rank 39 item in the normal world, again seeing out and saving at floor 99, then go back into the Land of Carnage and steal the rank 40 from the item god on floor 100. This is another game I didn't bother with Thieves too much on, so I can't speak from my own experience, but everyone says Thieves are kinda busted in this game, being able to inflict ailments such as sleep, but as for how the stealing percentage works, I would say if a Thief isn't working out, just level them up more, or just use your strongest character, even though they won't have the 99% effectiveness that Thieves would, and would have at most 50%. That's what I did. If it doesn't work out, save and reload. As for which items to get, again, you'll want the Omniscient Rod, the rank 40 staff, for your Magic Knight. But what about armor? Well, the Super Robo Suit, the rank 40 armor, is still a great one to use, as well as the Makai Wars, which can only be stolen from Ball. We'll get to Ball later, but these two accessories, along with the Omniscient Rod, are what I use to 100% this game. Your third accessory can really be whatever you want, but preferably of the exact rarity as the other three items. This is because just like in Disgaea 1, you get a 10% boost in all stats for each additional item you have equipped of the same rarity, meaning if all four of them are the same, you get a 30% stat boost. So save before entering the item world floor or stage where the item appears, and keep reloading until you get the desired rarity. Remember, legendary items range from rarity 0 through 7, so as long as they're all the same number in that range, you're golden. And here is where we get to the fun part, getting an item up to level 200. Now to get the absolute max stats out of this, you need to put single stat innocence in every slot on the item, tutors in the case of intelligence. But again, I did no such thing and still had to find time. The main reason I didn't do it though is because I mistakenly thought that they needed to be full stacks, as in level 19,999, to get the full bonus effect. This is not the case. Just like in Disgaea 1, whose guide I was making when I first found out about this fact, it doesn't actually matter what level they are as long as the innocent slots are filled. If all the innocent slots are filled, you'll actually gain a small permanent boost to that stat for every time the item levels up. If you really want to, you can always grind out these innocents to max level after. It doesn't make a difference either way, as long as they are on the item at some level in every slot when you're leveling it up. This is what gives you the stat bonus. For legendary items, you get 6 slots of innocence to start, and for every item king you defeat, a new slot opens up. There are item kings on floors 30, 60, and 90, with the maximum amount of innocence slots you can get being 8. So you're gonna want to exit the item world after each item king defeated and put another innocent in that slot before proceeding. If you're doing this, remember to clear the item of any other innocence it came with by repeatedly entering floor 1 until you find one, subdue it, can see out, remove it from the item, and repeat. But this time around, there is a lot more that goes into boosting an item's stats than just this. For starters, you can actually kill each item boss twice for an extra bonus. Normally, killing item bosses gives you a nice little boost to the item's stats when it levels up, and by again seeing out after killing one and going back in to kill it a second time, you can get that boost again. This isn't indefinite and only applies to the first two kills. And in the case of item kings, this means you can get both of those extra innocent slots on floor 30. Just remember to add a new innocent as soon as it's available. There also exists the innocent town. There is a random chance after each 10th floor that instead of the normal exit or proceed notice, you'll instead be transported to the innocent town. Here you can exit or proceed, but this is also where you can encounter the item assembly. Sometimes. It won't always be in the innocent town, but if it is, you can use it to pass bills exclusive to this assembly. You can only pass one bill per visit, and if you exit after getting denied, you don't get a do-over. These bills include more... 
Insert stat here, where you can increase the bonus obtained from leveling up in any one stat. These bills can be passed a total of 3 times for one item, so of course, the optimal way to perfect your stats is to encounter the item assembly and pass this bill after floors 10, 20, and 30. To save Gensies, I recommend killing the item boss once, Gensying out and saving, and then killing the item boss again before clearing the floor and hoping for an innocent town and an item assembly to kill two birds with one stone. Save and reload until you're successful. Of course, on floor 30, make sure to be adding those innocents in as well. This sounds like a lot to keep track of, and it kind of is, but this is only for stat boosting. We haven't even started talking about how to actually get your item to level 200. This is quite the process, so be prepared. There are two ways to get extra bonus levels on top of the one level per floor you obtain, and those are level spheres and mystery rooms. I talked about mystery rooms a bit before, and these things are extremely important when max leveling an item. The rooms that can grant you extra levels are ambush rooms and fortune teller rooms. In an ambush room, you'll be surrounded by 7 enemies of the same type, and if you manage to defeat all of them in 2 turns or less, you'll be granted 3 extra levels to your item. The Fortune Teller is a more risk-reward room. There will simply be one Geomancer NPC, and upon talking to him, he'll give you a fortune. The better the fortune, the more bonus levels you can get. The kicker is that these fortunes can also be bad, making you lose levels on your item. The fortunes can be good, giving you 3 levels, great, giving you 10 levels, or bad, taking away 3 levels. It doesn't end there though, if you keep talking to the fortune teller he'll get angry at you and actually start fighting you. Defeating him will grant you 3 more levels, meaning the maximum amount of levels you can get from entering this room is 13 with the great and the minimum is 0 with the bad fortune. The other way of gaining bonus levels aside from these mystery rooms is finding level spheres, which randomly drop upon entering a floor starting from floor 21 onwards. They get more common the deeper in the item world you are, and completing the floor while any member of your party is lifting the orb will give you 5 additional levels to your item, on top of the one you get from clearing the floor itself. Note that you won't gain the bonus levels if you go into a mystery room, and if the level sphere and a mystery gate spawn on the same floor, get the level sphere and go through the normal gate. It's more worth it than trying to go for the mystery room. The process of getting all extra 100 levels from these things is very strict. How I like to think about it is that you need essentially 100 bonus levels and you have 100 floors to get them. At one level per floor, you need an average of 10 levels per 10 floors. However, level spheres get a lot more common the higher up you go, and there aren't even any level spheres before floor 20, so it's okay if bonus levels are pretty slow going at first, you can make them up in the later floors. Because of this, you just want to get at least a few bonus levels before floor 40 to get you started and go from there. 10 or so would probably give you more than enough leeway, you just have to feel it out as you go. This is essentially how you max whatever stat you want on an item. When it comes to the item god though, there's something interesting going on. Since you can hit level 200 without going up all 100 floors based on how early you get your bonus levels, and you probably will if you're not paying attention, you won't get any boost at all for killing an item boss after you hit 200 since there is no stat gain to boost, the item is already maxed and isn't leveling up anymore. This means to get the boost from killing the item god, you need to make it so that clearing floor 100 gives you exactly your 200th level. This really only matters if you care about getting the absolute max stat you can on the item. The good news about doing all this is that you don't really need to do this with every item. I was actually so over it by the time I had only one more piece of gear left to level up, and so I just didn't and went to the last super boss and one-shotted it while also obliterating the highest damage achievement. This is with only 3 max level items, and not even nearly with perfect stats on them, since I didn't bother at all with tutors. So to recap reaching level 200 on an item and boosting its stats as concisely and clearly as I can, your primary goal is finding as many ambush rooms, fortune teller rooms, and level spheres as you can. 13 levels for great luck, 6 for good, and 0 for bad, including the levels from killing the fortune teller. Plus 3 for ambush rooms, assuming you clear them in 2 turns or less, plus 5 for level spheres. Go through a normal portal, not a mystery room portal, while holding the sphere to get the levels. Get at least 100 bonus levels using these methods throughout your run, saving and reloading as necessary. While doing all this, double kill every item boss and pass some more stat bill at the item assembly after floors 10, 20, and 30. This is what I did for all my items. But if you want to take it as far as possible with stat boosting, Clear the item of all innocents and fill it up with single stat innocents before running it, doesn't matter what level they are, put another innocent in after killing the item king and then again after double killing it, and get not at least but exactly 100 bonus levels to still receive that bonus from the item god. If you're a psychopath, at some point you will also max out every single one of those single stat innocents to level 19,998, and this should give you the absolute most stats possible on your item. With all of that said, we have concluded leveling and grinding. 
So let's go over what the achievements in Disgaea PC actually are. Disgaea 2 PC has a total of 55 achievements compared to Disgaea 1's 30. Just like before, I'll start by listing off all the achievements you'll probably already have by now if you've gotten to max level and gear. These include clearing chapters 1, 5, 10, and 13 of the main story, killing 100 and 1000 enemies, reaching level 100, 1000, and 9999, and your total levels across all characters being 5000 and 10,000. Collect a total of a million hell and earn 10 million hell from a single battle. You'll know it's above 10 million when super is displayed on the stage's end screen for your hell count. Deal 100,000, 1 million, and 10 million damage. There's also one for 100 million damage, but we'll get there later. There's one for defeating your first pirate in the item world, performing your first reincarnation, defeating the item god, attending your first felony trial, reaching 99 felonies, clearing cave of ordeals, and entering the land of carnage. Everything I've talked about in this video so far will lead you to all of these achievements. So what's next? Well, before we really dig into the meat of things, like the alternate endings and secret bosses, we'll clean up some of the other miscellaneous achievements you'll have to go a bit more out of your way for. The first of these is performing 10 reincarnations. Just like in the first game, these must all be on one single character, so just pick one at random, preferably one you've already reincarnated a few times before, keep reincarnating them at level 1, you can just quit and reload later to avoid the consequences of doing this, and you've got it. Thankfully, there aren't any promotion exams slowing you down this time around. There's an achievement for performing your first Peta spell. This is one you very well may have gotten already, but if you haven't, Peta spells are unlocked by element-specific mages and skulls at level 160, or 200 in the case of star variants. This means prism and galaxy variants cannot learn Peta spells inherently. There are separate achievements for both Magi Change and Magi Change 2, but before we talk about that, we have to talk about Axel Mode. Just like Etna Mode before it, Axel Mode is an alternate story you can choose upon clearing the main game. The enemy levels will continue to climb starting from where they were at the end of the main story, so make sure you're prepared for that. There are four episodes and there are achievements for clearing the first and final one. During the course of Axel Mode, you'll learn Magic Change, and performing one nets you another achievement. So what in God's name is Magic Change 2? Well, after unlocking Magic Change, a new mystery room can appear in the item world where you'll find Mal, the protagonist of Disgaea 3, and he'll give any one of your monster characters a special power. This is Magic Change 2, and giving this ability to a character via this room will earn you the achievement. Magic Change 2 allows a monster to Magic Change onto a humanoid even if they already have a Magic Change weapon, essentially just inheriting another ability. As mentioned before, there is an achievement specifically for acquiring the Yoshitsuna, so find that legendary Cosmic Blade and get to work. There is also an achievement for completing the extra stage called Evil Academy Special Class. This is actually three stages centered around Disgaea 3. The first is Mr. Champloo stage, unlocked through a Dark Assembly build after logging at least 50 hours of gameplay in your save file and clearing Axel mode. After clearing this stage, the bill for Razbarrel stage can be passed, with the extra prerequisite of clearing at least 30 Dark World stages. We'll get to the Dark World soon. The third and final stage is Mao's stage, again unlocked through a bill after clearing Razbarrel stage and with the extra prerequisite of unlocking the Land of Carnage. Clearing Mao's stage will earn you the achievement. Ah, <sighs> and I suppose we finally have to talk about the Dark World. Each map of the story has an alternate Dark World version of it. To unlock the Dark World itself, you need to find and hit five hidden switches throughout the hub world. This can literally be done at any time, they have always been here. But I recommend saving it for when you're strong enough to decimate enemies, because trust me, it's a doozy. After hitting the switches, a boss fight will occur. The first one is on the back of the pillar behind the Dark Assembly here, the second is on the corner of the map opposite of the Dark Assembly here, the third is on the corner of this house behind the item world or here, the fourth is behind this house, and the final switch is against this wall on the main walkway. After flipping these switches, a dark figure will appear under this tree, and after talking with her a few times, you'll fight her. Apparently the NPCs actually turn into neutral units in this fight, and can die permanently, meaning you can't use their functions afterwards. So if this happens, just save and reload and you'll have them back again, but if you're strong enough you can just destroy her right away and you'll be fine. Defeating her will unlock the dark world, but not all of it. Actually, only one stage, the very first stage. To unlock the rest, well, of course, you simply have to complete this first stage and the next will unlock and so on. Is what I would say if this guy 2 knew what common sense was, but it does not. You actually have to first complete the normal stage counterpart and fulfill specific requirements, meaning you have to do every single stage again to then unlock its dark world version. The conditions are different for every single map, and nowhere does it tell you this is the case, much less what the requirements actually are, so I'll link a helpful guide in the description. You'll know if you've fulfilled the requirements because a gate to the dark world is open message will appear either when the requirement is fulfilled or after completing the stage. In some cases, you'll get the option to go to the dark world immediately, and in a few stages, you just get transported there without warning. I'm not kidding. 
An additional hazard the Dark World has, other than its insane bullshit geopanel gimmicks and stronger enemies, is the Dark Sun. This sun will add even more bullshit on certain turns in the stage indicated by the Dark Sun schedule. Your best bet is to just wipe it out altogether, because yes, you can kill the sun. Choosing the Ascend command on a character will send that character up to fight it. If the character is strong enough, it'll kill the sun, or at least do some damage to it. A very important note is that sending characters with felonies to fight the sun will instead just make the enemies stronger, adding the number of felonies to their level. So you need a very strong character, I recommend level 1000 or more, with no felonies to use as fodder for defeating the sun in the dark world, unless you just want to deal with it, which I don't recommend, but knock yourself out. You'll also see a difficulty rating at the beginning of each dark world stage, but all this indicates is how much health the dark sun has, so if your character is strong enough, this should make no difference. It's now finally time to get into the alternate endings of the game, starting with the simply titled Bad Endings 1 and 2. For these, Adele must have at least 99 felonies on him. For Bad Ending 1, you also have to get at least 50 ally kills, which are simply gained by defeating your own units in battle. You can check how many you have in the Dark Record. For Bad Ending 2, you need at least 99 ally kills, one of which must be Rosalind. Just defeat the final boss again under these conditions to receive the ending. For Etna's ending, you simply have to defeat her during her boss fight in Chapter 3 of the main story, which is supposed to be a scripted loss during your first playthrough. Note that all of these endings will force you into a new cycle, so be prepared to be restarting the game a lot. Of course, you can just save scum a lot of these, but for those that require defeating an extra boss, like Etna, you also need them registered in your extra boss list for the EX Complete achievement, so save scumming is out of the question. We'll go over the extra boss stuff later. For the Axel ending, you simply need to get a game over in any of his boss fights in the main story. Again, this forces you into a new cycle, but you can save scum it. For the Tink ending, you have to get Tink to at least level 1000, and then proceed to solo the final boss of the main story with him. The ending comes in the form of a little extra segment after the normal ending, so don't worry if everything looks exactly the same for a while, because that certainly stressed me out. And finally, we have the Laharl ending. This one is a doozy, because you actually fight Laharl a grand total of four times in this game. And the extra boss list includes all four of these fights, labeled as Laharl A through D, so any of these that force an ending and a new cycle, you just have to go with. The ones that lead to an ending are Laharl A and Laharl D. Completing either of these will get you the Laharl ending achievement. Laharl A is simply defeating him during his boss fight in Chapter 11 of the main story. Just like Etna, this is of course supposed to be a scripted loss your first time around, but not anymore. Laharl D is a fight against Laharl you unlock by passing a Dark Assembly build called Pick a Fight with an Overlord that's only available during Chapter 1. I'll go over Laharl C and B when I talk about all the other extra bosses. Which is right now! Those are the only achievements we have left. Almost. There are a lot of achievements tied to specific extra bosses, so I'll go over those first. Starting with where we left off with Laharl. Laharl B is unlocked through a bill called I Want to Fight an Overlord. This is only available during chapters 12 and 13, and you need at least 30 hours logged in your save file. This is also where you fight Flan, so clearing this gives you both Laharl B and Flan in your extra bosses list, as well as the achievement for Flan. After this, Flan will join your party, which is important because the bill for Laharl C can only be passed with Flan as a senator. This is where we start utilizing Adele's Attend a Meeting option. Select this and you'll see the build that Flan is proposing called Summon Laharl, which unlocks the fight where you finally recruit Laharl as a unit, and that finally gives you the Laharl Defeated achievement, assuming you've already done Laharl A and D as well. So to recap Laharl really quick, because it confuses a lot of people, me included. Laharl A is defeating him in Chapter 11. Laharl B is passing the I Want to Fight an Overlord bill in Chapters 12 to 13. Laharl C is the bill Flan proposes called Summon Laharl, and Laharl D is the pick a fight with an Overlord bill in Chapter 1. There seems to be arguments on which one of these is actually A, B, C, or D, but regardless of which one is which, these are the four fights. Disgaea 2 sees the debut of Asagi, who serves as an extra boss with her own achievement. To fight her, you need to be in a New Game Plus cycle and then you can pass her bill, titled Fight the Hero of Another Game, whenever you want, with the only other prerequisite is that the character passing the bill needs at least 33 felonies on them. Curtis returns as an extra boss with two achievements tied to him, one for Curtis and one for Prototype Curtis. Curtis is the first fight you unlock, and this is done by using three Defender cell phones in battle, which will summon Pretty Curtis to help you. After you've done this, the bill Rescue the Defender is proposed by an EDF member in the Dark Assembly. Again, this uses Adele's Attend a Meeting to access. Cell phones can be obtained through various random means such as the bonus gauge, and there are a lot of different types. One type has the description Defender of Earth appears for a dramatic rescue, which is the cell phone in question. Depending on how much you've gotten done before this, you'll probably have enough of this phone type already, but if you don't and need to hunt some down, there's a mystery 
mystery room in the item world that contains a cell phone seller that you can find and pray they have enough for you lest you need to track down the room again. A lot of the early story maps will have cell phones in the bonus gate as well, so grinding Reflection Pond or something is also a viable option. After defeating Curtis and earning your achievement, you have to use three more Defender cell phones and again pass the EDF member's build, rescue the Defender again, to unlock the prototype Curtis fight. Prism Red is yet another extra boss achievement. This is unlocked through a build called Return of the Prism Rangers, available during chapters 12 and 13. No other prerequisites. Mid-boss, aka Vyres from Disgaea 1, also returns with an achievement. And this build is only available in chapters 1 through 9. It's called I Want to See the Ending, and you need at least 20 hours logged in your save file to access it. Note that this boss will lead to an alternate ending and force you into a new cycle. There's one more game restart for you. The staples, Prier and Marjali, of course, are also here with achievements. Prier's bill is called Unleash the Fallen Maiden, and only appears in chapters 1 through 9 of a New Game Plus cycle. Marjali's bill is called Break the Mysterious Seal, and can be passed any time by a character with at least 99 felonies. This fight is interesting, because she'll have three pieces of equipment on her that can only be obtained through stealing them in this fight, and only one is allowed for a save file. None of these are particularly important, but thought it was interesting. Overlord Zeta, of course, is here too with an achievement. This build, titled Meet the Strongest Overlord, can be passed at any point as long as you have at least 10 Dark World stages cleared. Now, there are still two extra bosses left tied to achievements, but given that they're the strongest in the game, and one of them you will literally want to do last for reasons that'll be obvious later, I'm gonna take the time here and clean up all the other miscellaneous extra bosses in the list. Thankfully, all of them are ones you'll have already beaten if you've done everything else so far. I mentioned the achievement for defeating the item god, which is also in the extra boss list, but also every other item world boss is on this list too, just like Disgaea 1. The item general, item king, and item god 2, which is still the ending god of a rank 40 item. Remember, you don't necessarily have to be in the land of carnage when you're in a rank 40 item. Also registered in this list are Mr. Champloo, Razbarrel, and Mao, who you'll have defeated in the Evil Academy Special Class Extra Stages. Etna is also here, which you'll have if you got the Etna ending, and also Rosalind, which refers to when you fight her in the bad ending too, so if you got that, she'll be here as well. Now, there are only a few more extra bosses to go. The first of these is, of course, Tyrant Overlord Ball. All that's needed to gain access to his bill, Meet Tyrant Overlord Ball, is to clear 25 Dark World Stages. It's pricey though, costing 9,999 mana. Ball's stats, as you would expect, are pretty high. He also has a unique item on him called Makai Wars, a reference to the NAS game Asagi comes from. This is the only way to obtain the item, and it is very strong, so I recommend stealing it from him. If you'll remember, this is one of the items I got up to max level and used to help with the other super bosses and damage achievements. That's not the end of the road for Ball though, because just like in Disgaea 1, you can rematch him, and upon rematches, you'll find not just Ball, but Prinny Ball, along with four regular Balls. Prinny Ball is an entry in the extra boss list, so this fight is required. Prinny Ball has significantly higher stats than normal Ball, so be prepared. Note that Prinny Ball also has a special item on him, the Prinny Suit. Again, this is a powerful item and can only be obtained here, so I recommend stealing it. Also, don't leave Prinny Ball as the last unit on the map, because his ability, just like normal Balls, doubles his stats when he's the only unit left. In the normal Ball fight, this ability is irrelevant since he's the only one on the map in the first place, but this can really screw you over with Prinny Ball. Now there are two extra bosses left. Next up to bat is Pringer X Go, the true final boss of Disgaea 2 PC. There's a rather annoying requirement to unlocking his build though, and that's to encounter the Pretty Ball Pirates in the item world. Yes, you heard that correctly. After defeating both Ball and Pretty Ball, they can actually appear in the item world as pirates in floors 91 and above, but only in the land of Carnage. I very much recommend getting the lowest ranking item you can find so the enemies have relatively lower stats to give you an easier time. The Pretty Ball Pirates will look exactly the same as normal Pretty Pirates, so make sure to check their title to see what kind they are. Depending on your luck, this could take a while. After defeating them, exit the item world and the bill for Pringer X Go should appear. This can only be passed in the Land of Carnage, and it's simply titled Face the Final Battle, costing 9,999 mana. Pringer X Go is pretty strong, but if you've done everything else, he should go down easy. The only thing to note is his rather annoying unique ability, which makes it so that he can't take any damage from special attacks he's already received. It's here that I would like to outline a particular strategy I use to basically nuke enemies, and this is the perfect place to show that off, considering this is both a relatively strong super boss and one-shotting him is preferable given his ability. What you're going to want to do is have five clerics who by default know the spell magic boost, then get two other magic knights who both know anti-whatever element you're going to end up using with your strong magic knight. If you're using an ice spell, use anti-ice on the enemy. This is learned at level 30. 
This is because anti-ice or anti-whatever element will make an enemy's affinity for that element drop by 50%. By default, Finger X Go has zero in every element, so using two anti-spells will have the desired elemental affinity drop to its minimum, negative 99%. This means it will effectively take double the damage from an attack to that element. You are basically doubling your own damage output on top of shredding the boss's elemental defenses, theoretically quadrupling the damage you deal. Unleash Peta, whatever element you want, and you should deal untold amounts of damage. However, I mentioned two more extra bosses. This is because you fight Pringer X Go not once, but twice. The last extra boss is Unleashed Pringer X Go. Once you defeat Pringer X Go for the first time, yet another build will appear in the Dark Assembly called Unleash the Land of Carnage, again costing 9,999 mana. This is truly the final challenge of this Gaia 2. Passing this build will supercharge the enemies in the Land of Carnage even more than normal, to an absurd degree, and the only way to reverse this effect is by starting a new cycle, so make sure you're ready for this before passing the bill. Once the bill is passed, all you need to do is enter Pringer X Go stage and defeat him again. Simple enough, and... Yeah, he's maxed out. Literally, he has the maximum amount of stats possible in this game. 160 million health, and 40 million everything else. And, uh, this isn't technically a new fight, this counts as you re-entering the stage, and... Springer X Go has a funny little quirk for his refights. There are eight of him. Here's what you're gonna wanna do. Run. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> kind of. See, there is some good news here. There is a very good reason we saved this fight for last, and it's much the same reason why we saved General Carter for last in Disgaea 1. It's because if you already have all the other bosses registered in the extra boss list, you'll actually get the EX Complete achievement immediately upon defeating the boss in battle. This is because the boss unit being defeated is what triggers it registering in the list, rather than completing the stage itself. And for this to happen, you only need to defeat one of these Springer X Go's, meaning you can enter the stage, nuke one of them, pop the achievement, and peace the hell out. Of course, then you don't get the satisfaction of having a completed extra boss list on your save file, but hey, that's good enough for me. If you want to go all the way though, I'll link a wonderful guide in the description. The author of this guide also made a similar one for Disgaea 1, and these really helped me a lot when playing them. And the very end of the Disgaea 2 guide outlines their strategy for legitimately beating this map. It requires a lot of extra preparation. As for me, I took my shiny blue ribbon, said fuck this map, and went home. Now, normally in these guides, I would save one particular achievement for last, the highest damage achievement. In Disgaea 2, this is the achievement for dealing 100 million damage in a single blow. Special skill animations should be off, because if an animation has multiple hits in it, those will be counted separately, whereas if animations are off, they'll all just be in one blow. This is because in most games, the big damage achievement is very difficult, but weirdly enough, it's very easy in Disgaea 2, provided you've already done the grinding outlined in this guide. Namely, an Omniscient Rod, Makai Wars, a Super Robo Suit, all at level 200, and of the same rarity, as well as your level 100 Elemental Innocent, Aeronaut, Firefighter, or Cryophile, level 100 Professional, and level 25 Magic Knight Lover. Having all of these, and using the strategy outlined earlier for super bosses with the magic boost and lowering enemy element affinity, will easily destroy that 100 million damage barrier and one shot even unleashed Pringer X Go. And with that, we have finally reached the end of the road for Disgaea 2. It was quite a long and tedious one, but I really hope this video was able to help you with your journey and make it just a little bit easier. If that is indeed the case, consider liking, subscribing, yada yada, all that YouTube stuff. I do plan on making guides like this to other Disgaea games as well, so feel free to stick around for those. And of course, if you have any lingering questions, feel free to ask in the comments. I also have a Twitter you can interact with me on, so consider giving that a follow for more detailed and frequent updates. Thank you so much for the support, and I'll see you in my next endeavor. Peace.